Okay, so here we are in meeting number three and we're still talking about positive behavior management. And here we're talking about the impact of punishment. Um, creates a negative cloud over the house, leads to negative emotion, leads to negative feelings towards the person, and daughter thinks negatively about herself. So we do some education <laughs> about it, and we try to get the parents to recognize the um, frequency that they use punitive strategies relative to how often they use positive strategies. We talk about how important it is to shift away <coughs> from the punishment to using more of the um, positive strategies. And the parents were pretty good about getting that and um, sincere about making the shift. And, um, you know, I think in the back, um, she's not here right now, but she had asked about, um, well, what about the use of punishment? You know, we, it's times you have to use it, and so, and it's important. But we just wanted to um, emphasize that you don't use it as the sole or the predominant strategy. And um, the other thing we wanted to get away from was, what would you guess was the primary punitive strategy that the parents would use? Grounding? No, although that's, that's a big one. And we all know that grounding it has some benefits, but a lot of not so good benefits in that it gets the kids to have to just stick around and they're grumpy and it creates more opportunity for um, getting punished. Yelling. So in a way, some of that was sometimes that was true. There'd be a withdrawal of affection and attention, and that's a really destructive strategy. So we definitely um, would work with the parents on not doing that one. Um, but the other one was just yelling at the kids. You know, they get all worked up angry and they just kind of um, throw all of that on the kid. And with, I think Karen was a nice example of um, how do they, how do good, how well does that work? Not at all, because they just turn it off. Yeah, I've heard it before, I don't, so what? So the yelling was a common, and it was a hurtful strategy, but not an effective one. So we really wanted the um, parents to get away from using that particular um, strategy. Okay? All right. And, um, boy, I, you know, one of the things I keep noticing is that I um, keep saying to myself, I was really surprised at this. I thought that, and then it turned out it was different. All right? So here's another one of the surprises, and that was empathic listening. Um, I thought we could teach the parents pretty effectively how to use empathic listening. I mean, I, would, I heard at lunch um, people were talking about um, the grad students and how great clinicians, what great clinicians they, you all are. And you're getting all these compliments. And so one of the basic skills as a clinician is empathic listening. Where did you learn to do that? You didn't, did you? You just kind of naturally do it. And um, so I thought Parents could, you know, pretty naturally do that. Well, it turned out they couldn't. And um, we taught them how to do it. And um, we'd be into like the second meeting of teaching them how to do it. And they were still having a lot of trouble with it. So we ended up having to simplify the whole process and just turn it into listening to what your daughter says without offering solutions. And that was it. They really had a difficult time um, reflecting back the emotion, reflecting back the meaning, and taking it to a deeper level. So, 
uh, maybe you know people who are naturally good at doing that gravitate towards this field. I don't know, but um, sure they sure did have trouble with it. So um, if you're a 12 or 13 year old girl and your parents listening to you, what? It's the message that that communicates. I'm worthwhile. Yeah, they care about me. So um, one of the very co most common things that they said to us before um, treatment was, you know, no one ever listens to me. No one really cares about me. So just getting the parent to listen and be able to reflect back what the child said was um, fairly powerful and useful. Um, the steps to empathic listening. First step was you, the um, daughter asks to talk with the parent. Parent clears their mind. Um, that's not always easy to do. It's not always easy for us to do as the therapist. We get kind of stuck on the other things that are going on. Um, daughter states what she wants to say. Parents listen without thinking of rebuttals or solutions. So, um, you know, you get the defensive parent. They don't listen and just take it in. They want to rebut. Well, I wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be a problem if you'd just do this, you know, kind of thing. Um, or um, they come up with solutions. And really, all the kids want to do is be heard. And then recognize the emotion and the meaning of what the child said. And then um, parent states their understanding of feelings and meaning. So really, we had to just shrink this down to um, listen to what kind of clear your head, listen to what your child says, and reflect back what she had to say. That's the best we could do. But the kids liked it anyway. OK. And then um, towards the end of the third meeting, we also worked in an introduction to problem solving. Parents were pretty good at that. And then um, between the third and fourth meeting was the individual family meeting. And um, during that individual family meeting, what we really worked on um, was the positive behavior management and individualizing it to the specific family. I did some work on the empathic listening, too. And um, that's right. We also identified what goals the parents had for their family. So we started to broaden out um, the skills that they were learning and where they were going to apply them. So we wanted them to also apply those skills to, to the other kids in their family. Um, you can even apply it to your spouse, you know? Being more positive, um, listening to what they have to say, the good strategies for everybody. Um, with the kids, it's doing something fun. With your spouse, it's date night. So it was a pretty, you know, we talked about how these things could be generalized, and it, it, I think it was helpful. All right, fourth meeting, daughters are back in again. Um, the parents were using the um, re reward coupons. Again, identify um, behaviors they want to see in the meeting and then um, reinforce the kids for that. So once again, the positive behavior management, effective communication training, and um, the steps to effective communication are um, brevity, don't blame, behavioral specificity, empathic listening, feeling statements, give alternatives, and congruence. What does that really mean? All right, it would mean that um, What's the rule when you're working with um, parents of ADHD kids? How long does Barclay recommend that the statements are? Short, 10 words or less. So you want it to be just real succinct. So we're trying to teach the parents to keep things pretty succinct. Um, 
I can think of multiple times when I've been working with um, cases and the parents come in and I have them talking with their child and um, all I want them to say is something like, um, you know, I really, um, really appreciate it when you pick up around the house. And instead, you get this 10 minute monologue. <laughs> yeah, the lecture. And they go on and on and they get into so many things, that bottom line message is lost. And in one of the um, families, it leads to all these other battles. So it started out about picking up um, things in the kitchen, and it ends up with um, how the child's angry with the parent for do it have the parent having done this two years ago, and the parent's mad with the kid because they came home late on Friday night, and on and on and on. So keep it short and to the point. Don't blame. Um, parent, be real specific about um, what behavior you want to see or what you're talking about. Do that listening. Add in some feeling statements. Um, offer alternatives instead of um, demanding things. And then congruence between affect and what you're um, saying. So um, I, when I, this is a long time ago, when I did my internship, I did it, in dust, it with an, an industrial organizational consulting agency. And um, I was doing some consulting, and um, I had to meet with this boss. And he, he was the president of the company. And he, my job was to interview people and tell them who were the best of um, this group of employees, because he was going to have to do layoffs. And um, so while I'm interviewing him to find out more about the company, more about the situation, the guy would say um, things like, yeah, somebody's going to end up losing their job, and their family's going to be without an income. And then there'd be this huge smile on his face, like a Cheshire cat smile. And um, so there's this incongruence between his affect and what he was saying. And um, Karen's over there grimacing, because it really was. It was kind of creepy, because the, his statements and his affect didn't fit together. And so I didn't know if he was heartless and didn't really care, and he was just saying these things, or if maybe he was kind of anxious and felt really bad, and so he grimaces, he kind of smiles when he feels that way. Couldn't really tell. But um, so I want, when I'm working with the parents, for the, the, their affect to fit with what um, they're saying to their kids. And the same with the kids, you know. I want them to um, learn to keep their affect consistent with what they're saying, too, when they're communicating with their parents. So that's just that idea of congruence. I would probably have wanted you know, like maybe even four to six meetings for this, but I didn't have it. We were lucky, as you saw, just to get the parents there for a total of eight meetings. Um, also in the fourth session, we did some family problem solving. Um, and the nice part of this was we had the kids teach their parents how to do it and illustrate how to do it. And that worked out really nicely. Um, and the parents got it that it um, reduced stress, led to more kind of success, led to um, everybody kind of getting along better in the family. So that one they seemed to um, learn pretty easily and pretty successfully. Conflict resolution training. Um, here are the steps to it. And um, you know, it's really establishing a family meeting. You agree to meet. The person who called the meeting um, states what the issue is, gives some recent examples, um, states the impact, and they discuss alternatives. Okay, 
So which of the skills have they learned so far that's embedded in here? Problem, problem solving, there it is. So um, it's really just kind of a form of problem solving that is applied specifically to um, interpersonal conflict within the family. So um, it's, a, it's setting up family meetings and then problem solving the conflict that exists in the meeting in the, within the family. That seemed to go pretty well. Uh, when I listen to the tapes and watch the tapes, it seems to go pretty well. So I was expecting this one to take more time and not go as well, but it actually did. Um, so in session six, the girls attend the meeting and um, they worked on conflicts. Okay. So again, here's exposure. They would um, come up with, we actually gave them um, situations to role play and practice the conflict resolution skills. And um, we gave them a situation that was um, their daughter wanted to um, wear some clothing that they thought was inappropriate. And they had to solve that problem. So the kids really got into it. It was real and the parents kind of got into it, but it wasn't overwhelming because it was hypothetical. So um, it also gave us an opportunity to get the kids and the parents to use their coping skills too. So if one of them was getting upset, the therapist could say, hey, it looks like you're getting kind of worked up. What could you do to calm down? Or what are you thinking that leads you to be upset? So it could bring together a lot of skills. And um, so we started with hypothetical problems and we worked up to real life problems, but we kept them pretty um, modest in terms of the level of um, upset that was associated with those problems, all right? The sixth meeting, um, was one in which we had the girls explain to their parents um, some of the most common th negative thoughts that they had. Okay, so if you step back and you think of yourself as a parent and your daughter is explaining to you um, and describing a negative thought that she has about herself that leads her to feel really depressed, what kind of impact is that going to have on you as a parent? <laughs> You're going to feel really bad and kind of feel sorry for the, the child and again it's going to lead to some kind of, it has an emotional impact so it's going to lead to some um, uh, motivation to um, help their child to stop doing that. And it's also going to lead to some kind of more intimacy because all of a sudden they're talking about some things that they don't usually talk about. So in a way it's a, some communication training. And the kids end up finding out, okay, I just told my mom about how I feel about myself and some of the thoughts that I have about myself. And so, um, hey, she reacted real supportively. That's kind of nice. I'd like to have that happen again. I feel better as a result of doing this. So um, we had them explain the thought, how it relates to their emotions, and then um, how we've been teaching them to change their thinking. So we tried to have the daughters teach their um, parents how to um, help them restructure their thinking. And then um, after that, at the end of that meeting, we talked about, just because it turned out it was a pretty powerful meeting and emotionally. And so um, we talked about the importance of emotional support and how that um, helped the girls just to feel better.
Okay, um, session seven was an extension of the conflict resolution skills. We talked about, because now we're just with parents again, barriers to using the conflict resolution skills. And um, we're going to try to then problem solve those barriers. And um, we had the parents think back about the last week and um, the experiences the last week and also um, over just what happened um, between meetings and um, what their thoughts were that would get in the way. Sometimes it was things like um, fairly kind of autocratic, like um, they really didn't want to talk with their kids about things. They just should do it because they told them to do it. And um, there are things that the kids should do because their parents asked them to do, but then there are other things where it's helpful to have um, a discussion and really talk it through and work it out. So um, it was when the parents were on either extreme that it was a problem, and so we tried to bring them to the middle. And um, we introduced the idea of the power of the apology, that we all make mistakes sometimes, and as parents, we make mistakes too. And what is the impact of making a mistake and apologizing, recognizing it and, and accepting it and apologizing? Um, that was one of our uh, grad students' ideas. It was um, Mary Yancey who had that idea of the apology. And it turned out it was really very powerful. So it was a great addition to the um, manual. Helped to reduce conflict. Reduced quick way to get through anger and open communication. It models a lot of positive things for the kids. Um, we also did some linking in seven. We did linking thoughts with emotions and cognitive restructuring. Um, now, again, the daughters aren't there. So on the even sessions, the daughters are there. The odd sessions, they're not. So um, we were able to um, talk pretty openly about thoughts and the relationship between um, thoughts and emotions in their kids. And um, the parents started to talk pretty openly about their own negative thinking. So part of this study um, included the parents completing the Symptom Checklist 90 revised. The idea being there's a relationship between parental depression and anxiety and depression in the kids. So um, I was expecting that to be a mediator or moderator of outcome. And um, it turned out none of the parents endorsed any depression. So um, you would expect you're going to have at least the amount of depression, number of people who are depressed in the average population. You're going to get at least that. We didn't get anybody who endorsed depression. So I think it was because we administered the um, measures in the schools, typically. They thought, uh oh, what if this information gets out? And so I think parents ended up faking good. It blew a bunch of studies that we had and then a lot of articles that I was expecting to be able to do, but that's what we got. And then in the meetings, the parents would say things like, um, I was listening to tape the other night, and the therapist said, so how are your daughters, how are your girls doing? And one of the moms said, um, my daughter's doing great, but boy, I'm just doing horribly. I'm depressed again, you know? And so, they would reveal in the meetings the difficulties they were having, but they didn't um, reveal it on their assessment, which was really too bad. So anyway, towards the end of this, um, the intervention, when we're talking about their um, negative thoughts, 
the parents really started to, um, they did a lot of self-disclosure and the therapist taught them how to apply the cognitive restructuring strategies to their own negative thinking. And um, some of the parents were able to accept that very openly and were grateful, and others accepted it as, um, well, it's useful for you to learn how to do it so that you can show your daughter how to do it. We get it. You don't have any problems. Everything is cool. But you can model it for your daughter. Okay, So um, that ended up um, working pretty well. The other um, kind of therapeutic concept, I guess you'd call it, um, that the parents really got was that their children are like sponges. They absorb the things that are going on around them. And um, so, you know, we would ask the parents, if you compliment your daughter, what does she absorb then? Positive message. If you pay attention to her, what does she absorb? Yeah, I'm worthwhile, I'm lovable. If you um, listen to what she has to say and she doesn't feel judged, what's the message? What does she absorb? If you punish, what's the message she's going to absorb? And if, you repeat, if the, your daughter repeatedly is exposed to the same message over and over, so she's absorbing it over and over and over again, what happens? It becomes part of her. And the parents got it. And um, what happens if you verbalize lots of negative thoughts yourself? They absorb those too. So, um, you know, the one that kind of sticks in my mind is, well, there's a couple. When I've worked with a lot of the um, parents of anxious kids, um, I remember one of the kids that I worked with who had OCD and had the germ fear, um, the parent was a surgeon and um, washed a lot, but also when I wanted to do exposures to restrooms, the parents said, uh-uh, you can't do it. They are dirty, nasty places. Do you know what kind of germs are in there? There's no way. And then I said, okay, what about escalators? The railings, your um, son's really fearful of touching those, thinks he's got to like shower after being on an escalator. Uh-uh. Do you know what it's on people's hands? So, um, you know, it's pretty clear that the kid also, in addition to having the um, biological basis for OCD, um, was getting the messages that there's a lot of nasty things out there that you just can't touch because if you do, you're going to get really sick. So, um, you know, I see it a lot in the anxiety disorders, but you also see it in the depression. If a parent is saying, um, to their child, oh, you got to watch out, um, people are going to hurt you. You know, they just take, take, take from you, they never give you anything. You know, then that's establishing, if you hear that over and over and over again, um, that gives you the belief that um, the world's kind of a hurtful place, a dangerous place. Paula? Did you find that with, you know, kind of talks a little bit about the social information processing where you talk about the you know, negative attribution bias. Is there some study showing that, you know, like minority parents exhibit that at a higher rate? Oh. Um, did you find any, you know, differences in, in your treatment? Kind of I don't know, but I'll tell you what. Um, I'll look at the data, and if we do, we'll, I'll send you the data and we'll work back and forth on it. Okay. Yeah, it's a great idea. We didn't look at that, but um, that's a real possibility. So we have, um, we have a, I think we have some measures that would allow us to do that. So let's exchange emails and we'll talk about that and 
we'll get some of the students on our end involved too. And we'll see what we can come up with. Great idea. Good question. The fun thing about being here, one of the many fun things about being here has been you guys are in such a great program and you all are really taught to be um, really first class researchers. So it's been really fun to be in that environment and talk about research and grants and all that kind of stuff again. It's been really cool. Um, let's see. Okay. So we wanted the parents to become thought detectives for themselves and for their daughters. And they, they started to do a pretty good job of it. It, it, was, it was nice to see. Between seven and eight, there was another um, individual family meeting. And um, the emphasis was on use of conflict resolution skills and on helping their daughters to catch the negative thoughts. So you can see we kept working on that, um, working on reducing conflict. It's probably the most consistent finding in the literature is that um, in the families where the kids are depressed, there's a higher level of conflict. And you know, some of it's from the kids are irritable and um, short-fused. So it's not just a one-way street from the parent to the kid. The kids elicit some of that. And in fact, there's one study where they found after successful treatment of the child, the family changed. And there was a reduction in conflict. So it really pointed out that um, there's a, a real strong child component to it, probably due to that irritability and their negativity. And you also could see it because the kids withdraw. So the parents are like, hey, you never come out anymore. You never spend time with us anymore. You don't do the things I ask you to do. Well, the kid's withdrawn, has fatigue, is having difficulty with sleep. So they're not going to be um, as easy to um, parent. OK, the last meeting, um, we were trying to think of a way to um, go over what they had learned. And so one of the grad students said, is, let's play family feud. And so um, the families would divide up into family units. And then the therapists had all these questions. And they earned points. And we worked it so everyone won anyway. But it was, um, it was actually pretty much fun. And everybody had a really good time with it. And then we um, did a lot of problem solving for the future, like what are things that the parents think they might come across that are going to make it difficult for them to apply the skills. And um, you know, a lot of the parents were, hey, my daughter's 13. What's she going to be like when she's 15 and 16? And wow, there's a really, um, challenging world out there. What am I going to do? And so um, we talked about how to use the different skills um, in the future when they face the new challenges. And um, then there was a lot of, you know, there was a formal kind of saying goodbye. Now, one of the um, groups, I think you could see a bigger impact on the parents um, that was probably really important. One of the moms said, um, in around the sixth meeting when we started to talk about termination, she said, um, can't we just keep doing this? This is one, my one night a week where I get to go out. I don't have to babysit. I get dinner. I don't have any dishes or anything else to do. I get to talk to s someone and... All right. OK, so um, I was mentioning that um, there was this added bonus kind of effect, and that the one mom had said, wow, you know, this has um, been my one night out. It's really great. Can't we keep it going? Um, in that same parent group, 
Um, it turned out it was all moms. There weren't any dads. The one mom one week came in and said, you know, this is really fun. We ought to bring in some really nice nail polish. And we could all do each other's nails. That would be really fun. You know, so they, they formed these real kind of nice relationships and got real comfortable with each other and, um, you know, wanted to do other kind of um, pleasant things with each other, recreational kind of things. So, um, you know, I think that that speaks in part to when you're doing research and you're doing outcome research, there's a lot of unexpected things that go on that contribute to the therapeutic effects. So, um, fortunate, no, we didn't. Yeah, well, we did have control, uh, control group for it, so that was good. But um, if we wanted to do this in a more methodologically rigorous way, we could probably have um, the parent training as it is, and then we could have a parent social group where the parents just get together, talk, do some fun things, um, do fun things with their kids and see, you know, is it the skills? Or is it the meeting together? Is it the having fun together? What is it that contributes to the um, therapeutic benefits? Nobody knows. I mean, that's the kind of amazing thing. When you think about what we've talked about in the last two days, how many studies have there been of the effectiveness of interventions for depressed children? Not adolescents, children. How many would you guess? It's only a handful. There's only a couple that are really uh, methodologically rigorous. And then the others are things like they learned six skills in six sessions, and that was over six months. It's not going to work. No child's going to remember what they did a month later, what was in the meeting. You know, things like that. So um, there, we really don't know much about how to treat depression in kids. We don't know why it works. You know, there's theories about why it works, but we don't yet know. So this is an area that's really wide open for doing um, research. Okay. Any, um, any questions about the parent training or um, how does it fit with like the um, PCIT stuff that you know, um, and the other kind of parent stuff that you do around here with the um, kids that have ADHD. How does it fit with the PCIT stuff? Um, we definitely do kind of training, so that's it's really similar in the way, and it's definitely the using praise. It's really what we teach parents, and it, it really makes a huge difference. So when you were talking about it, I definitely see that. Um, you know, it would be really nice to do what I'd really like to do is take some of the PCIT stuff and infuse it into this and, um, you know, get the parent and the daughter together in the room and then have the um, therapist watching and coaching with the bug in the ear and all of that. I think that'd be really powerful. And that's the thing, the beauty, I think, of the PCIT. It's not so much the skills that are taught, because they're taught in multiple different um, interventions, but it's really the way, the technology of doing it that's really unique and cool, and the coding and all that that goes along with it. So it'd be nice to bring some of that into um, this area. Tuma? So um, one thing, I'm thinking about like group processes in general. So for the disruptive behavior disorders, we worry a little bit about CBMC training. And I'm wondering about for kids who are depressed, um, you worry about the whole rumination. I can't imagine you would worry about it too much during the group because you have the therapist uh -huh. meeting. But what about when they make friends with each other? Yeah. They, you know, um, it's a good question. The um, experiences that I had, I've had so far with it, um, and it actually goes way back to um, my dissertation. And um, so my dissertation was um, evaluation of a self-control treatment for depressed um, children. 
And um, in, I remember in one of the groups, one of the girls um, had a neighbor who had horses. And so she would talk in group about how she'd go over to the neighbor's um, ranch and, <clears throat> excuse me, and groom the horses. Well, the other kids were saying, wow, that's really cool. That must be really fun. Do they ever let you ride them? <clears throat> and she said, yeah, they do. Every once in a while, I get to take them out just riding around the ranch. And so one of the kids eventually ended up saying, could we come over? <laughs> and she said, sure, that'd be great. So they developed this friendship, and it centered around this neighbor's ranch, and they started riding horses together. So that was a real positive thing. And I think that it contributed in a pretty dramatic way to the improvement of those kids because they built friendships. They did something that was fun together. You know, you think the horses and horseback riding has therapeutic value. It gave them a sense of efficacy because they're, you know, um, they were sixth graders and they're up there riding these huge animals and getting them to do what they want. Okay. So it was a pretty cool experience. So that was the um, kind of example that first pops in my head. In general, um, you know, I think it's been positive and the building of friendships was good. Now the um, other situation also came up and that was, you know, I've got so-and-so in my group and I don't really like her and we haven't gotten along together. And the therapist would have to say, that's okay. All you have to, all we're asking you to do in group is just be nice to each other. You don't have to become friends. You don't have to hang out together. It's just be polite and nice to each other while you're in group. And that ended up working out okay. I was also thinking of another situation when, uh, with Karen. So when Karen was saying that she was trying to oh, yeah. throw a girl after uh -huh. her, so what if that girl that she's trying to talk to is kind of depressed and that girl's not in treatment? Right. But then how does the therapist find out whether these new friends, this behavioral experiment uh -huh. that Karen's doing is actually kind of taking it? Absolutely. I worried about that from the start that I was thinking, especially given the description of um, the girl, I started to think, oh no, you know, this could be a child who has all kinds of difficulties. It could be a cutter, it could be somebody who's doing drugs. So I, wanna, I would want to be really, really careful about encouraging that. If you remember on um, the first day, I, oh yeah, it was just yesterday, wow. Um, so yesterday, in the first role play, um, I gave her the homework assignment to still look for other kids. You know, or somewhere in there, it's a little murky. But anyway, the, I had thought in my, to myself, ooh, this might not be a good one for her to get to know. So I think I'm going to encourage that she gets to know others. And then if I find out that this girl's not very healthy, then I'm going to encourage her to go this other direction. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, I think it's a good question because you do see, you definitely see that in the um, kids with disruptive disorders. You see it with the kids who abuse um, substances, chemicals. So, um, and you, you do see it to some extent in the depressed kids. You get the kids who are really dark that hang out together. And that can be a problem. So um, you'd want to help them break out of that kind of group and get into a more positive and uplifting group of kids. Because otherwise they get stuck. You know, if you're just around um, people that are real negative, you're going to stay pretty negative. So why do you want to stay in the dark cloud? Why don't you come out and feel good stuff? Paula? And then I was thinking, you know, like if, when you mentioned comparing to PCIT or other treatments, your thoughts on, you know, like PCIT, there's like a master criteria. Yeah. You know, moving on, uh -huh. skill, or even OCD, you have to finish the hierarchy and, and things like that to yeah. ensure that they have mastered it to ensure the maintenance of the game. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, kind of 
like how many parents, you know, like figuring out how, how well the parents were and using those skills, or even if the child themselves mm -hmm. had mastered some of those. Yeah. Getting a certain number of behavior activations into place versus cognitive skills, like all the good they got. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I think that um, we did do some um, uh, manipulation checks. So we actually did have the kids um, complete these quizzes that were supposed to assess how much they used the skills outside of the sessions and how well they understood them. It was, it was fairly, um, wasn't as good as I would have liked because um, when I was training the grad students who did the treatment, and um, they really were extremely good, um, but they, their um, directive was keep working on the skill until the kids really have it. And they thought the kids had it, but I don't think that they always did. So I would have um, liked to have had more time to um, get them to master it. But you know, as we're talking about all of this, I keep, um, I notice that I keep repeating, I wish I had had more time. I wish I would have had more time with the parents. But when we were talking about um, what's fundable research right now, the hot topic is how do you shrink it down to a minimum number of sessions. So, because we know people don't engage in therapy for that long. So, it's kind of, it's kind of like these two forces working against each other. And um, my conclusion as um, a clinician is, I think that sometimes um, the pressures for research are unrealistic, and that they don't um, capture the complexity um, and, at some level, really the difficulty and in what's involved in um, successful therapy. It takes a lot to produce change. And it, that's more true, I think, in um, depression than in, um, like, OCD. I think in OCD, um, the intervention is real clear, it's real straightforward, and it's just getting the maximum number of ERPs done and having good hierarchies and having a good relationship so the kid stays in therapy. But um, I think it's more complex with some of the other disorders. Yeah, so I guess the answer to the question, so if you think about the um, list of the communication skills, remember the first one was brevity. <laughs> so I got off on a lot of other things. So really the answer to the question is, um, I don't think that we were successful at getting the kids to master the skills. I think um, we got them to a moderate level of mastery, but not to real total mastery. And um, I think it, that it could be creative researchers, creative clinicians can think of more, um, maybe more powerful or different ways to um, help the kids master the skills more quickly. And I think a lot of it's creativity. You know, like how can you make it fun and engaging and actually engage the skills and learn the skills? That that might be the key. I don't know. Karen, I, I have, ask Karen. This is, uh, <laughs> this is probably already been answered, um, but I'm not aware of the literature that well. If I've got a couple different ways of asking it. How important is it to change core beliefs? If I had a, a, a patient that I was seeing, and I didn't know about the whole cognitive development of treatment, and I just started with uh, basically your first skills, coping the problem, uh -huh. that. And I yeah. continued that for a protracted amount of time. Um, would their beliefs eventually change? You know, that's, I think that's a great question. And, and um, if we go back to the basic premise of the cognitive model that we are active seekers of information and we draw meaning from that, then cognitive restructuring is going on all the time. Mm -hmm. 
And so it could be that the most effective way to change it is through the coping and problem solving and the behavioral activation. It's a real possibility. And I remember that social study um, comes out of um, social psychology where they had a group of students put pencils in their mouths and look in the mirror for 10 minutes a day or something, and they reported more elevated mood. Uh -huh. People who didn't put a pencil in their mouth, and they weren't even smiling. They were just using those same muscles. Uh -huh. And if you're using your muscles so uh -huh. to speak to engage in more positive experiences, then you get all this positive feedback, and then you start believing different things about yourself, presumably. Sure. So I'm wondering if you're developing treatment, and we do. Uh, we always fight with granting agencies and schools and things like that about the amount of time we have. Would you, now knowing all, all uh -huh. you know from this, rather have 12 good sessions of your coping problem solving, uh -huh. the whole first part of treatment, or would you rather divide it if you only had 12 sessions? Would you divide it into six and six because you believe that the, right. the cognitive part? You know, I've, I've actually, um, someone else, I forget who it was that asked me that question, but um, I, you know, I think it was, I think it was in a discussion that um, Phil Kendall and I were having when we were developing this um, prevention program for, um, and um, also one of the researchers out of Norway that was involved in the project, Kiki, she, the three of us were having this conversation. And I remember Phil raising that question, would you rather have um, 12 good sessions of this, of that first part, or would you rather have six of the coping problem solving and six of the cognitive restructuring. And the answer and the conclusion the three of us came to was um, 12 good sessions of the coping and problem solving and the behavioral activation. Because I think that in 12 meetings, I can really teach the kids and get them to use coping. And I can teach them and um, kind of get them to use problem solving. But um, in six meetings, I'm not going to get enough. Um, they're not going to master the skills as well as they could in 12. And probably six sessions of cognitive restructuring is nice. It's more than the typical thing in the literature, but I'd want more. So I'd go for the 12 coping and problem solving and then just getting them behaviorally activated. And so to take that a step further, do you feel like the do you feel like the cognitive part of this has a huge bang for its buck effect size wise? I don't know. Oh. Um, you know, if I look at the qualitative study where we interviewed the girls after they got better and asked them um, what they thought helped them the most, it was split. Oh, yeah. Some of them said that it was the coping skills, some said it was problem solving, and some said it was cognitive restructuring. And um, I remember one of the um, uh, girls in particular uh, that, because I had done the um, uh, diagnostic interview with her, and then um, I remember listening to the tapes of her as she was going through, and then listening to the interview of her um, in the student's dissertation. And um, she stated that she benefited the most from the cognitive restructuring. And when I reflected back on the sessions and my impressions of her, I thought, oh, she's going to be really good at this. Because she was really insightful and introspective. And um, she had a lot of the prerequisite abilities for doing the cognitive restructuring. And so she did it, and she did it really well. The other interesting thing with her was um, her parents, she was randomly assigned. She was randomly assigned to the CBT plus parent training group. Her parents also attended all eight of the parent training sessions. So they were really invested, too. And they were really invested in Oh no! What what might me, what messages might we have been sending to her that led to this way of thinking? And boy, we're going to change those. So that that was really nice. It just worked out well. It all complemented itself. It's almost like the treatment worked the way I had envisioned it in my head. 
So, um, yeah, so it just varied. So the kids reported it. it uh, um, if I, I'm not positive, I don't remember the exact percentages anymore, but um, a, there were more of the kids who said that it was the coping act, kind of behavioral activation skills. And then there were um, about an equal number who said problem solving and cognitive restructuring. And there wasn't much difference between the three, but it was still a little bit more dominated by the coping. And, I, and in part, I think it was the coping um, because that was really, um, the kids got it. They got it real quickly and easily. And since we did it in every session, it really drove it home and they um, became, to answer Paulo's question, they became competent at the coping skills. And I uh, remember I mentioned that we started by teaching them to use it with um, something fun, fun and distracting. We did hula hoops. The sales of hula hoops went through the roof in the two communities where um, you know, we did it because the girls had so much fun. They all wanted hula hoops. And they asked, where'd you get them? How can I get one? And so we told them how to get them. And they went out and got them. So um, they really got that. They got the um, coping skills training really well. There is one study um, that looks at, um, it was, um, Dember, D-E-M-B-E-R, I think it was around 1992 or 93. Can't remember for sure the date, somewhere 92 to 95. And um, Dember did a study where they looked at the um, uh, number of meetings, number of hours it took for kids to benefit from problem solving training. And um, if I remember correctly, um, it was 39 hours. 39 hours of training in um, problem solving in order to learn how, learn how to do it, apply it, and improve from it. So you think about that. I always think about that, and I go, wow, I'm doing like five or six sessions. And um, you know that's one sixth, and then I go back to the pressures to shrink everything down, make it happen really quickly. Well, maybe it's not possible to do that. Maybe our expectation or our desire is unrealistic. Maybe the change process really is something that's slow and complicated and takes time. I don't know, but um, you know that little that piece of research um, clearly showed that kids benefit, well, first it showed kids do learn problem solving and that they benefit from it, but it takes a long time. One person role play being a depressed um, child and the other person role play um, eliciting negative thoughts. And go ahead and try a restructuring strategy, okay? All right, so we'll um, try it for like 10 minutes, we'll stop, we'll process it, and then we'll um, call it a day, okay? All right, so it's um, 5 o'clock, and I want to thank you all for um, attending and for your participation, Karen, for role-playing all those times, and for all the good questions, and for you all being so um, hospitable and having me here. And, the great, you know, the fun discussions about research and things like that. So, um, you know, when you, um, let's see, so if I have a minute here, what are the things that I'd, in a minute, that I'd really want you to take away from this, I guess would be um, thinking maybe about the, um, what goes into the overall treatment. Starting with psychoeducation, followed by coping skills, then problem solving, and then into the cognitive restructuring, okay? And that the helping you with that cognitive restructuring is the idea that you are, that kids actively seek out information and the way they respond to it is through the meaning they draw from it. And so that helps me if I have that in my head, allows me to empathize and think about the child and 
um, think about how I'm going to help them to restructure their thoughts when we get to that point. Um, I think we, um, again, in the little bit of time you had to role play in pairs, uh, an important thing that came up was how important it is to have a good relationship with the child so that the restructuring doesn't come across as, as interrogation or as um, you know, belittling the kid or anything like that. So that's really important. And um, let's see. And then I think the um, other thing to keep in mind is that the parent training piece is really important because our data is showing that it leads to greater maintenance of treatment effects. You know, we looked at some of the kids we had for up to four years, and um, we did growth curve modeling, and so we were predicting based on their trajectory where they were going to end up, and it all showed real clearly that the um, parent training played an important role in maintenance. So um, it's important to include that into the overall intervention. So um, thanks again for your participation, and um, hope you all have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.